Okay, so welcome everyone. It's good to see you. Now, if at all, any time you happen to listen to one of these talks or someone else's talk, then I would highly recommend you not to listen to my words, but actually to the underlying silence inside of yourself. That's by far more efficient as a teaching than any word could ever be. Because the function of everything I'm ever talking about is to just simply point to that state. So if you can, uh, during this talk, and find that quietude inside of yourself, and listen to that, or alternatively, listen to the gaps in between my words. That's where it's at. That's where you can find the true spiritual essence or at least it's kind of like a doorway to it so uh, as I mentioned last time this week uh, we're discussing um, consistency and intelligence in the practice so last Saturday the talk was about right consistency and today it will be about three types of intelligence. So the first type of intelligence would be a very basic type of intelligence that um, is in relation to the first of the three trainings. It's the basic intelligence to recognize what is harmful and abandon it and to recognize what is beneficial and cultivate it so that ability to recognize what is harmful as harmful that ability that, that recognition that you could say is very basic intelligence and that's not for granted definitely not many people consider what's harmful as being a source of benefits and many people consider what's beneficial as a source of harm. So there's this is general confusion about what's harmful and what's beneficial all around the world. So for example, I'll give you a simple example that happens quite a lot. You want someone to listen to you and they don't. So you scream and shout at them. So it's a very basic action that hopefully will get me the benefit of that other person finally listening to me so therefore I must yell at them so they can hear me but it's uh, the technique doesn't work because the louder you yell the less they want to listen to you <laughs> right so that's a very basic thing or lying for example the belief that a lie gets you into a better position in life a more favorable position or, um, you know, there's a many, many such things that even lying to yourself, you know. Like if I pretend that I'm someone that I'm not, people will like me. Also, that is very common. And nowadays with social media and so forth, we have all the means in our hands to actually express that lying to ourselves. To show ourselves in all the favorable poses and all the nice situations constantly suggesting that our lives are non-stop awesome when they're not yeah. very often we all feel human emotions and feelings not being honest about them doesn't help it doesn't help us to heal it doesn't help others to relate to us properly it doesn't help us to relate to others properly it doesn't lead to kindness and compassion and so here would be something, as an example, that is highly beneficial. Kindness. To be kind. To be kind to yourself, of course, always starting with yourself. But allowing that kindness to then naturally spread to others. In an unforced, effortless way. Just because you're kind not because you try to be kind to others but you're kind to yourself that would be 
then recognizing what kindness is and the, having the ability to actually apply it when it is needed, that requires a basic intelligence. For example, to notice that when you're meditating and you're busy beating yourself up because you're so distracted. Now, let's say the first basic intelligence kicks in and you suddenly recognize, oh, I'm beating myself up. I'm beating myself up unnecessarily and I'm actually not relaxing. I'm really tense about trying to be enlightened. And of course, it doesn't lead us anywhere. And so then this basic intelligence, as I said, just it kicks in and suddenly you realize, oh, here's what I'm doing to myself. It's actually harmful while outwardly looking really nice. I'm sitting cross-legged, my eyes are folded and I'm having a happy smile on my face. But internally I'm really I'm in a, at a full-on war with myself. I'm trying to suppress all my negativity, pushing it down, pushing it away. There's a term for that, it's called spiritual bypassing. It's very, very common. People completely avoiding their darkness. Going totally into their light. Seeing through that requires a very sharp form of intelligence. Seeing that you're actually busy avoiding what needs to be dealt with desperately that requires a big deal of intelligence. Because, you know, we go for what feels nice. We go for all the nice illusions in the mind that tell you, oh, you need to, you need to do this, you need to be always happy. There's no place for sadness, there's no place for your emotions, there's no place for your shame, your guilt, your fear. And we all carry it. Every single one in this room has it. And by suppressing it and trying to get rid of it, it doesn't get any better. It usually gets worse. And you wear that spiritual outer garment, but underneath there is all that smell, the smell of guilt and shame and fear. and all, It's all there. And sometimes the more thin that, or the more thick, that outer garment is the stronger the smell underneath it. I've said it many, many times when we have these retreats every week. Some of the happiest people in the beginning are the ones that collapse the hardest. Day one, they're still floaty, all meditating, enjoying themselves, and day two, big collapse, which is very healthy, it's good. And so finally they see that they're busy actually hating themselves. And they're trying to use all these spiritual techniques and gadgets and tools to somehow erase themselves, to somehow overpaint themselves. We can see that online as well, the, the, just simply using filters, right? To beautify something. We like to do that with ourselves too. We don't want to be raw and authentic and real. We, most of us are constantly busy hiding things. So that requires the basic intelligence of seeing like, wow, I am enabling harmful states to linger on, to hang around, by coating them in this fluffy light of niceness. <laughs> and so that they are trapped in there. Our darkness is very often trapped in our nice outer appearances. Here, look at me smile, look at me posting a nice wise quote. Look at me saying nice things and behaving properly. And then I come home and I lock the door behind me and I just collapse on my bed and feel like shit about myself. I look into the mirror, I don't like what I see. Of course, that we don't post that. Deep down inside, when I turn off my phone and I close my books and I have no one to talk to, the depression comes up. 
I have no idea what to do with it. And the anxiety is there, and I don't know what to do with it. To anyone who doesn't believe that, I think that's good that you're not believing that. I would rather suggest maybe putting it to the test. Go somewhere where you're quiet without distraction, just by yourself. And then see if you're really, really okay with yourself. Not distracting yourself, right? Not looking into books or having a phone or internet or online or conversation or people around you that could distract you or just general stuff to do. But just you is one of the hardest things. You know, I'm sitting here right now in front of you talking about all of this. This comes from years of experience of so many times through my spiritual practice I felt, wow, I really figured it out. It's so nice. I'm so enlightened. And then I went on my next retreat. And the first week or the second week is hell. I feel like I'm losing my mind. There's so much hate, so much anger, so much shame and guilt from the past. It's pretty frightening stuff. But I don't see that when I'm busy in my office, answering mails, running around, busy, busy every day, teaching here, teaching there. I don't see it. So that's why it's necessary for us all, because we're all human beings, we're all holding and harboring stuff like that, to give ourselves that kindness to look with intelligence at ourselves and see, ah, here is where I'm actually avoiding myself. And if you can recognize that, these little avoidance techniques, I call that, that's a spot-on, sharp, intelligent mind. Fantastic and very rare. Extremely rare. That's hard to find. It's, you can also call it honesty, right? Looking deeply into yourself, unafraid. Why unafraid? Because you're able, and here comes the good news, you're able to receive yourself with kindness. You can receive yourself, your anger, your guilt, your shame. You can receive all that with kindness. That's your great power. You can be kind to your pain. Isn't that cool? Isn't that something amazing? You can be nice to your pain. Like a nurse or like a mother that takes care of her sick child. You can take care of yourself. But of course, that's a skill that we need to learn. And it takes that intelligence to first of all recognize, oh, there is pain. It hurts. And I'm busy avoiding it. We all are. We all are great at avoiding ourselves. So, and it is a very useful thing to, at least sometimes every day, to have a look. A real, honest, good look at ourselves. You can call that meditation. Now, what's the second level of intelligence? Whereas the first level of intelligence is recognizing what's beneficial and nourishing it, feeding it, recognizing what's harmful and abandoning it. You can also say forgiving yourself. Being kind to yourself. That second level has to do with the cultivation of tranquility, stillness, empowering your mind with samadhi, with single-pointedness, you can say. So when you're cultivating samadhi, when you're going deeper into the practice, and that is quite easy when you have done step one well. When you really learn to be kind to yourself, guess what? If you sit on a little square mat, just you, it'll be very easy to relax into yourself because you love yourself. And when I say you love yourself, I, I don't mean you like your muscles or you, you, you like your, I don't know, eyebrows or whatever. <laughs> you like your eyebrows? <laughs> I like them too. Yes, 
So that doesn't mean self-love. Self-love doesn't mean today I take a bubble bath because I love myself. Self-love meaning to be okay with your light and your darkness. To fully accept that. To, because love, true love, is based on acceptance. To be okay with the way it is. And you can immediately see the benefits in a relationship. Let's say your significant other is worrying. And you let them worry. Instead of telling them, shh, don't worry. And I might add on as a whisper, because it makes me uncomfortable. I don't want to deal with your worries. So I say, don't. Right? That's not kind. It would be kind to say, well, you have a right to worry as much as I do have a right to worry. Please be my guest. My space is wide open for your worries to be there. I accept you fully. And that includes your worries, doesn't it? Now, th that is what you could call love, or kindness. We're accepting someone else in their entirety. And how could we do that if we're not able to accept ourselves in our entirety? Meaning, all the things that you don't want to look at inside of yourselves, all the hidden stuff, the stuff that you hide from others, the stuff that you don't want others to know about, all that, if you can fully accept that, you become whole. Love makes you whole. That's why it's beneficial. So when you then sit down on a mat, you, you're going to have no hard time relaxing into yourself because you're great friends with yourself. You like hanging out with yourself. There's nothing to criticize, nothing to fix because you see you're not broken. And so, ah, it's nice. I sit here. Ah, I don't even need distraction because... I like my company. I don't have to look into a phone. Why? Why would I need to? Why would I need to look elsewhere if I like looking at myself? But why do we look elsewhere? Because secretly we don't really like looking at ourselves. <laughs> It's a bit scary, it's a bit unknown, there's a lot of things, uh, we don't really know what's going on in there, subconscious and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> Who knows what's lurking in the darkness? Who knows what's also lurking in my light? Most people are even more afraid of their light and their power and their love and their kindness and their forgiveness. That is even more scary for most people. Have you ever noticed how hard it is to say, I'm sorry? Or sometimes just how hard it is to say a few kind words to someone else. What will they think of me? As if it was like something really, really bad, saying a few kind words to someone else. So anyways, yeah, second type of intelligence. That's what allows you to relax your body on the first level. You have to have some intelligence to see where you're blocking yourself. You need a discernment. It's a type of discernment to see clearly, I hear I'm holding tension. And then releasing it the right way, meaning without sacrificing your posture, Keeping the right posture, relaxing from the inside out, softening from the inside out, opening your body, practicing properly. Let's say that, because it's the first stage is pretty physical, if that is translated into yoga practice, if you practice yoga, it's very common nowadays that people over push. They hurt themselves. Why? That's because there is a basic lack of intelligence like they don't recognize I'm inflicting harm on my body. Why not? Because there's ego. I want to touch my toes so I can finally take that Instagram selfie of me touching my toes or something. 
And so we push and we really go for it and injure ourselves and hurt ourselves. Why? Because of basic lack of intelligence, of a specific intelligence. I'm not saying to, to, you to have no intelligence. It simply says that there is a specific type of intelligence needed to fix that. To, so you're not hurting yourself, right? The same thing with when you're sitting in your proper meditation posture. It's important to know how you're sitting. Train the posture properly and then so you're not hurting yourself. And so you relax in the body. You're cultivating benefit for the body. You're actually nice to your body and kind. Second stage, basic intelligence needed here is the intelligence of recognizing that you're thinking about the past or the future and that that actually makes you agitated. That will take a while to see that clearly because we're so lost in our thinking mostly that we don't recognize, we don't have the contrast. Here is me not thinking at all. It's great, very easeful, it's very nice. And here is me thinking about the past and future. Having that contrast then gives rise to the intelligence. Oh, because it hurts. I notice I'm thinking of the past and future. I notice it because there is pain. There is a tension in the mind. The body is here. The mind is elsewhere. The mind is having breakfast while the body sits doing its evening meditation. That split is painful. But we don't recognize it as painful because mostly we are never in any other state other than split constantly. Our bodies being here, our mind being elsewhere. Right. Then it takes wisdom furthermore to let go or intelligence to let go of the voice in our heads. To recognize the talker, to disband from the talker, to let it fade into the background. Here you need a very refined form of intelligence that intelligence to not treat the voices in your head as your enemy, but to let them not matter. Let them fade into the background. They don't matter anymore. And that takes a while to develop that type of intelligence that allows you to do that. Fourth, the intelligence that allows you to stay properly with your breath not aggressively pushing yourself onto the breath and not uh, kind of losing yourself in a dull, hazy state of mind. It becomes gradually more and more refined and so as the meditation becomes more refined, your skills and your intelligence has to become more refined too because the tasks at hand are becoming more and more subtle. So you have to be able to spot really subtle things and in the beginning, we always fail with that. And then you keep doing your practice until you've banged your head against the wall often enough so you recognize, ah, there it is. That little spot here, I'm blocking myself. I'm in my own way. That, it requires intelligence. Otherwise, you just keep doing what you're doing every day and you're not developing any skill. So intelligence is absolutely necessary for developing a skill. Just like consistency is. Now the third type of intelligence, the highest kind of intelligence, is knowing itself, awareness itself. So we are not anymore kind of dealing with objects. Now it goes back onto the subject itself. The one who knows, the one who is aware, the one who sees the world, or the one that the world appears to. That's the highest form, the most refined form of intelligence and wisdom, you can say. It is awareness itself. Yes. So gradually, through our training, we are refining our behavior mentally, that means in thought and intention. Secondly, in stillness, the intelligence that requires to attain stillness. And thirdly, the intelligence that it takes to achieve a breakthrough. Being empowered by kindness, stillness. Finally, your eyes are so strong that you can see through things. You wake up. Okay. 
And so with that waking up, there is a complete cessation of suffering. There's an ending of stress. The world still goes its way, but you don't feel anymore that you are some little person that has to do their life so that their life somehow ends up the right way. That fades away. So all the suffering that's connected with that also fades. All that personal stress that we experience fades. So to give a, a short summary, last time we are talking about consistency, this time we are talking about right intelligence. Last time I said consistency alone is not enough. It has to be right consistency. And right means it is consistency in combination with intelligence. So that simply means that you know when something doesn't work, so you're able to change it. You not consistently continue doing what doesn't work, but you're able to recognize, ah, it doesn't work, and through intelligence you can change it. And probably one of the first steps of intelligence is to relate to a teacher to meet somebody, no matter where, no matter who, who has experience on the path, and then exchange and seek advice and seek guidance. Then you get a practice. From that practice, you need to then learn how to make it work for you. And so that takes time. So learning to meditate properly takes time. And takes sincerity, it takes a lot of honesty. And yeah, if all that is there, you can call that right consistency. You're not in a dull way consistent. You're not just repeating an action because you've heard it's good to do that. If I do, let's say, if I walk around the Buddha statue 20,000 times, I'll be enlightened. And so you walk around the Buddha statue 20,000 times, but with a total lack of intelligence, you will not end up enlightened. I guarantee you that. Even if an ancient text says it. But if you walk around it 20,000 times with intelligence, chances are you get enlightened. And chances are that it doesn't take 20,000 circumambulations. So that's the, the difference. It, instead of just stupid repetition, Go for clever investigation. See, how, what am I doing? How does that work out for me? What's my direction in life right now? Meaning, what kind of state am I in right now? Where do my actions emanate from? If you can see that clearly, you're in an advantageous position. Okay, so that's pretty much all that comes to mind for tonight.